In 1997, James Cameron's Titanic movie set sail in the box office, and the world of cinema has never been the same since, with this epic love story and exploration into the tragic voyage of the RMS Titanic turning Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet into huge megastars. Set in modern day, Titanic is about a team of treasure hunters exploring the Titanic wreckage to find a long lost diamond necklace called the Heart of the Ocean, where an elderly lady called Rose claims to have worn the necklace the night the ship sank. Rose is brought to the explorer's ship, where she tells of her time on Titanic, where she was an upper class passenger who met a third class passenger called Jack, where they began a love affair, a love affair that was forbidden by the class system of society expectations. But above all, a love affair that encountered the tragedy of the Titanic after the ship hit an iceberg in an adventure of survival and chaos in this movie that is one third period piece drama about the Titanic and early 1900s society, one third romantic drama and one third disaster movie. So today we are going to explore James Cameron's Titanic masterpiece by looking into 10 things that you didn't know about this movie as we try to answer many great questions surrounding this 1997 movie. Like, which actors were originally considered to play Jack and Rose? Is James Cameron really that difficult to work with? What happens when you spike soup with mind altering drugs? And is the Jack Dawson character secretly a time traveler? Yes, all that and more. Let's check it out. Number 10, it grew from James Cameron's love of the Titanic. Although in the 80s and early 90s it seemed that director James Cameron had a love for action-packed science fiction movie spectacles, what with him directing the two Terminator movies, Aliens, The Abyss, and True Lies, his true passion was not a futuristic robots or aliens from other worlds, but in fact long lost shipwrecks of old. And of course the granddaddy of shipwrecks was the Titanic the luxury ship that hit an iceberg and sank on its maiden voyage. The seeds were kind of put in motion for the Titanic movie in 1992, when an IMAX movie was released called Titanica, which thanks to an expedition featured footage from the Titanic wreckage, where Cameron seeked funding so he could have his own expedition and explore the underwater wreckage. And it was there that Cameron got to work on a Titanic script. Number 9, the studio was reluctant because it wasn't like Terminator. Cameron led several expeditions to the Titanic in 1995, where he and his crew would film actual footage of the Titanic. He wrote a script which to him was something of a morality tale, a tragic love story of the ages that explores the society outlook on upper class versus lower class, especially of the early 1900s, along with the female lead being alive now in modern times as a link between now and the past. Cameron took his script to 20th Century Fox and pitched the movie which he described as being Romeo and Juliet on the Titanic. But 20th Century Fox were unsure if a three hour love story would sell, asking Cameron if there were any action sequences or car chases. In other words, more like the Terminator. But given that Cameron had previously directed Terminator 2 Judgment Day, which was the biggest movie of that time, they wanted to keep Cameron happy, so they can work on future projects with him so they greenlit Titanic. Some of those projects that 20th Century Fox were hoping to work with Cameron on was a supposed Spider-Man movie and a Planet of the Apes movie. But what they actually got was Avatar 13 years later. Number 8. Rebuilding the Titanic Cameron wanted to be as authentic as possible and wanted the Titanic ship in his movie to be as close to the real one. So much so he managed to get access to blueprints of the original Titanic and basically rebuild it to its exact scale and detail. With the help of 20th Century Fox, 40 acres of waterfront was purchased in Rosarito in Mexico, where a 17 gallon water tank was constructed in order to film the ship's exterior and scenes of characters in the Atlantic Ocean. In order to bring the Titanic back to life, miniature models were also used, as well as CGI. The interiors were designed by James Bond set designer Peter Lamont, of which he and his team studied designs and fashions of the 1910s. Titanic's budget consisted of a staggering $200 million, making it the most expensive movie of its time. So there was a lot gambling on Titanic being a hit. I'm 
mean, damn. Cameron was so hell-bent on his Titanic ship looking exactly like the real one, he even hired Titanic historians to inspect the ship to make sure it's down to a T. It all sounds crazy and slightly OCD, but it was all worth it, as his care and attention to detail really pays off. Number seven, passenger possibilities. So the big question is, who could play the two main love leads of Jack and Rose? The casting was one of the most important aspects, as the romance was the main strength of the movie, and had to be convincing. Tom Cruise was interested in playing Jack, but his fee would have been too high. Cameron asked Jared Leto to audition, and he declined. Jeremy Sisto did several screen tests, but ultimately wasn't cast. Leonardo DiCaprio was recommended to Cameron, of which DiCaprio originally wasn't really all that interested in the part, and while doing test readings, he even resulted to goofing around the place. But Cameron still saw a spark in DiCaprio despite his boyish, cheeky misbehaving, and cast him in the role. Despite DiCaprio's flippant attitude to the part, Kate Winslet really wanted the role of Rose. Several big-name actresses of that time were considered, like Reese Witherspoon, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Winona Ryder. Cameron wasn't originally sold on Winslet, but was immediately won over by the British actress after seeing her screen test and amazing chemistry with Leonardo DiCaprio. A young Lindsay Lohan was going to play that little girl who Jack describes as being his best girl, but it was decided that her red hair was too similar to Rose's and her mother's. As for the movie's villain, the sinister antagonist Cull, well, supposedly Rob Lowe pursued the part but didn't get it, along with Matthew McConaughey. Although some sources suggest that he also sought after the Jack role too, so who knows? Billy Zane got the role as Cameron was impressed with his performance in The Phantom one year earlier. Kathy Bates took time out from torturing James Kahn to play the rich socialite, the unsinkable Molly Brown. She was one of few to play a character in the movie who was actually based on a real person who was on board the ship. David Warner was cast as Carl's brutish right-hand man, Lovejoy. He's kind of like the odd job of Titanic and Bill Paxton was cast as Brock, a modern-day marine explorer who is searching for the heart of the ocean diamond. And, well, let's face it, having Bill Paxton on board will make any movie that bit better. After the release of Titanic, there was something of an urban legend that an actual Jack Dawson was in fact on board the real Titanic. Well, that turned out to be sort of true, as there was a Joseph Dawson who worked in the bowels of the Titanic shoveling coal of which he sadly lost his life due to the Titanic disaster. Number six, erratic perfection. As mentioned, Cameron was a perfectionist with his craft when it came to making Titanic. He was so hell-bent on everything being authentic, he even hired an etiquette coach to teach the cast of the upper-class passengers how to present themselves in a 1910s manner. Cameron himself even drew the famous sketch of Rose wearing the heart of the ocean. However, his attention to detail also supposedly caused some tensions on set. There are stories of Cameron's hot-headed style of filmmaking as far back as the first Terminator, but his supposed hard-hitting manner was even more exposed during the making of Titanic, with him being dubbed the scariest man in Hollywood, with stories of him yelling at the cast members with a megaphone and swooping down right in their faces while sitting on a crane. Kate Winslet said that she was, quote, frightened of him and could never work with him again unless she was paid a ton of money. And on one occasion, she even chipped her elbow bone. A 90-hour per week work schedule took its toll on DiCaprio, with the young actor suffering exhaustion several times during filming. Several of the cast and crew even developed colds and flus as well as kidney infections from spending long periods of time in the water tank that was used for filming, along with stories of stuntmen breaking bones. Co-star Bill Paxton said that Cameron was not one for winning hearts while making movies, claiming that he had an alter ego called Midge, which is Jim Backwards. However, one of the strangest stories associated with the disconnect between Cameron and his cast and crew is a supposed incident while filming in Canada where an angry crew member spiked Cameron's soup with the drug Angel Dust, which led to 50 people who ate the soup to be rushed to hospital. <laughs> Yikes. So whether or not the Titanic movie came from the heart and pure imagination of Jim, or the tyrant filmmaking of Midge, or both, one thing is for sure. These efforts gave us a classic, memorable movie. Number five, the broken wooden door controversy. 
So in the movie's climax, we see Jack and Rose in the freezing waters of the Atlantic Ocean after the Titanic sinks, where Jack helps Rose seek refuge on a floating wooden door to keep her out of the lethal water temperatures, which of course leads to Jack's death. Over the years, this has caused great discussion and debate among fans who believe there was more than enough room for Jack to also climb on board the wooden door and thus his death could have been avoided. I've even seen some fans get downright angry and accuse Rose of being a terrible character for not sharing the floating piece of wood with Jack. Even scientists have chimed in on this cinematic controversy and concluded that although there would have been room for Jack on the chunk of wood, had he climbed on board, then it would have sank. But this didn't stop the fury of outraged fans who claimed that Jack and Rose could have taken turns of laying on the wooden door. In fact, this dispute has gotten so out of hand, James Cameron himself had to shade light on the outrage, where he concluded that Jack simply gave up having a spot on the piece of wood so Rose could survive. And that's all there is to it. It was just a matter of Jack protecting Rose at all costs. But yeah, you know the debate of a movie is pretty insane when even the director has to get in on the case. The broken off piece of wood isn't the only fan discussion involved with Titanic either. There are some fan theories that Jack himself caused the Titanic to sink, as he saved Rose from leaping off the ship, and thus had Rose jumped then that no doubt would have affected Titanic's trajectory. And thus probably wouldn't have even hit the iceberg. And even more insane are claims that Jack is also a time traveler, hence his stylized 90s haircut. Jack also mentions going fishing at Lake Wysota, which was a man-made lake built in 1917, five years after the sinking of Titanic, Jack also mentions riding on the Santa Monica Pier Ferris wheel, but that wasn't built until 1916, four years after the Titanic sinking. So, who knows, maybe Skynet set Jack to save Rose from jumping off the Titanic, as she was John Connor's great-great-great-great-grandmother, and in doing so, caused the Titanic to sink. Number 4. Titanic After Titanic Titanic understandably had a long legacy after its release. The movie in fact holds a record with it still being shown in theatres when it was released on VHS. Now keep in mind that Titanic came out in December 1997 and its VHS was released in September 1998. That's almost a year of being in theatres. Cameron's love for the Titanic didn't end with the movie as in 2003 he made a documentary movie called Ghosts of the Abyss which is about him and a team exploring the Titanic's remains at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, where viewers can get really up close and personal with the world's most famous shipwreck, and I highly recommend it. The documentary also features Bill Paxton and a scene where the crew learn of the 9-11 attacks, a scene which literally binds two tragic disasters together. Then in 2012, a 3D conversion of Titanic was released, of which the conversion cost $18 million, and even replaced some of the movie's night sky scenes with real night sky footage, as opposed to CGI sky. There are even talks of building a replica of the Titanic and calling it Titanic 2, and setting it out on the exact same voyage as the original. The irony is this was the plot of a 2010 movie also called Titanic 2. Spoilers, they hit an iceberg. Number 3, Titanic originally wasn't going to have a song attached to it. Oh yes, we all know that track, Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On, and on and on and on it did, as there was no escaping this song in 1997. It was everywhere. This was without a doubt a love ballad that went a long way, which is quite impressive during a time of bubblegum pop with the likes of Spice Girls, Hanson and Backstreet Boys. Whenever Dion's musical vocals start calling out you're here, people's minds automatically instantly think of Titanic and seeing Jack and Rose on the front of the ship. However, Cameron originally had no intention of releasing a song to go with Titanic. He wanted the music of the movie to have no words. Titanic was scored by composing legend James Horner, where he gives Titanic a timely tune, which often sounds both Celtic and tragic, but always powerful. And he saw potential in recording a song using cues that he had written for the movie, where he met with Celine Dion and lyric writer Will Jennings in secret and recorded a demo of My Heart Will Go On. And when Cameron heard the track, he was instantly sold, and My Heart Will Go On became part of Titanic's ever-growing success. And go on, it has. In fact, it's never really stopped. Number 2. Alternative Ending 
As with most movies, there are tons of deleted scenes that didn't make it into Titanic and ended up on the cutting room floor. The movie is three hours long. Naturally, there was going to be scenes that didn't make the cut. Some of the scenes that fascinate me were more scenes involving the Brock character and his obsession with finding the heart of the ocean, along with a scene where Rose enters the third class part of the ship, where all the surrounding passengers go quiet and just stare at Rose in awe. Yeah, I'm glad this scene was cut as it's kind of corny, even by this movie's standards. But a scene that I wish they left in was a look at Titanic's gymnasium. Yeah, the scene doesn't add anything to the movie's narrative, but it's always a joy to explore unseen parts of the ship. However, the most notorious deleted scene is without a doubt the alternative ending, where we see elderly Rose go to dispose of the heart of the ocean, as in the theatrical version, where the crew approach her and try to stop her from dropping it, where Brock begs her to let him hold it just one time, which she does, where he then lets her drop it into the ocean, where he learns a lesson that living life is the true treasure he should seek. And there is even a hint of romance brewing between Brock and Rose's granddaughter, where Rose then goes to her cabin to meet Jack in heaven. Personally, I prefer the theatrical ending, as Rose dropping the heart of the ocean in the sea should have been a personal, intimate moment just for her. Her liberation, so to speak. And that kind of gets ruined by having everyone showing up and yelling at her not to do it. It makes more sense for Rose to be alone, as she can then move on to the next world on her own, making the moment more about her than some life lesson. Number 1. Titanic Mania Before its release, there were rumours that the production of Titanic itself was a disaster, as both 20th Century Fox and Paramount Pictures were responsible for the distribution of Titanic and wanted the movie to be released in early July, as that is a popular season for movies to be released in but Cameron insisted that the movie's special effects weren't ready, with its release being pushed back to December. Despite this, word of mouth got around that Titanic is a brilliant epic movie, thanks to test screenings, and thus, despite missing its planned July release, Titanic would go on to make over $2 billion in the box office, making it the highest grossing movie of all time as of 1998. Suddenly in 1997, Titanic was a huge deal and was everywhere. In fact, Titanic was to 1997 what 1993 was to dinosaurs. Titanic was nominated for 14 Academy Awards and won 11, a feat not achieved since 1959's Ben-Hur. And so in 1997, everyone fell in love with the tragic voyage of the Titanic, a story about the strength of love in a time of chaos and disaster. A movie that made us all remember a real-life tragedy from long ago. But above all, a movie that teaches us to make it count. As I have a huge interest in the Titanic itself, I naturally have a love for the movie. And it's almost like a time capsule. It takes you on board the Titanic of 1912. Never before has looking into the Titanic felt so personal. Yeah, some of the dialogue can be seen as cheesy at times and even seems dated by nowadays, but DiCaprio and Winslet still managed to pull it off. As for the difficulties of James Cameron, well, before making Friends, his job was to make a great movie, which he did. So he does get credit for that, even if he supposedly wasn't a nice person while making it. Anyway, I'm Minty, and I'm the king of the world!